I'm here with Tony of Venom. How are you doing today, sir? Very good, Ian. It's nice to be here. It's nice and sunny. We're in LA. We 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 had a great weekend. We played uh, the Blackest of the Black, invited by Glenn Danzig, and uh, with ministries who saw tendencies. Just a great weekend at a great location in Silverado. Yesterday we had a wander down to uh, Venice Beach and walk in the sun. Life's good. Life's good. Right, absolutely. I saw a lot of pictures coming out of the Blackest of the Black Festival this weekend while I was at Rock, Oklahoma. And just all the pictures like you guys, Ministry, uh, Dez, and the guys at uh, uh, Devil Driver. Yeah, so it looks like yeah. you guys did have a great weekend. Yeah, you know, the thing is, uh, up in the canyon there, and, and uh, you know, in a way, w what was quite good is uh, there wasn't a really good Wi-Fi and there was no phone signal. So everybody just had to forget all of that stuff and just have a good time. Uh, and from the minute we got there to the minute we left, everybody was smiling, all the bands were all chilling. It was like a real sense of community in, in the metal uh, arena there. You know, fans and bands are like, everybody was, looked like they were just having a great time. It was a pleasure to be there and, and a real honor for us to be part of it. So it was, it was a blessing in disguise having all the uh, data service and cell phone service knocked out because like you, you had to, you had to, you had to kick it, you had to go back to the olden days, man. It was, <laughs> exactly. It was totally old school. It was like, you know, these days you go to a concert and, and sometimes it's hard to see the band because you just got cell phones up in the air. Right. Uh, but this way it was like old school. It was like you, you, you couldn't, you couldn't text message people and Snapchat the shit out of everybody. So you had to just focus on having a good time, speaking to people, actually speaking to people, and watching and enjoying the show, which just made for such a great, great event. It was really, truly great. Heck yeah, then you also got to see the people's faces in the crowd and not their cell phones. So hell yeah, man, that makes it awesome. Yeah, totally, totally. Well, you guys uh, you guys announced some pretty big news today. You guys are uh, going to be kicking off a uh, North American tour that you guys are going to be doing uh, in the summer, starting off fall, going to be going out with uh, Godor, a few other guys. So uh, tell us a little bit about, about that and how that tour came about. Yeah, well, the, we, we, you know, we um, we uh, took uh, um, the last half of the uh, well, probably December into February to uh, to sit down and to start writing uh, an, an album, a new album, so that we could, uh, you know, John Cezula is our personal manager and, and Chuck Billy is our band manager, and, and they were quite insistent that we should get some new music going and then look for a label, and so kind of we took that time out. Because um, since we decided to do this, it's just been non-stop touring. Every time we've sat down to think, well, we, we'll have a bit of a time off, we, we get off at more shows. So, And we just kept saying yes, you know, so we're kind of not planning everything. We were just going with the floor. Um, but, we, 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 you know, we, we knew we were going to do the album, and then uh, we picked up some festivals, and then it was planning the first tour with the new album. And for us, it just seemed natural that we should come back to America because... You know, we've we've had such a great time in the last few years coming through America and doing so many dates everywhere. And, you know, we're, we're received so well and, and everybody's been so warm to us and the support has been amazing that we, we felt the, uh, America or North America, because, you know, of course we go into Canada too, we, um, we just felt they deserved to be the first people on the planet to get us playing the new album tracks uh, to them, and so it was natural that we would we would uh, uh, come back to here. And then looking at the package, you know, there was lots of uh, bands uh, uh, opportunities for that. But we 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 thought we had a good pick because Toxic Holocaust, friends of mine, and and I go to a really great band. And again, they're fans of us. We're kind of all fans of them, and so it should be a, a great a great package and a great night. And and to do so many dates in America is uh, it's just a wonderful way to launch the album, you know. And at Blackest of the Black, we actually <clears throat> we actually played the title track from the album for the first time to anybody ever anywhere. Oh, nice. Uh, and it, again, it, that even felt like it's we should have done that. America should have heard it first, and so we saved it specifically for that show. So and the reaction was superb. So you know, it, it, it's all good. It's all good. Oh, yeah, you can't beat that. You got to, especially you know, a lot of times people go to those festivals and everything, and they want to hear the old stuff, the stuff they know. So when you do get a great reaction out of a new track, man, that's just got to make you feel good and get you ramped up for the release of that new album. 
That's exactly, you know, and, and, and I mean, uh, of course, the set we did, you're limited when you do a festival. You're, you're not doing a headlining spot. You don't have an hour and a half. You can't play through a, a load of stuff, really. So, you know, we concised it to make sure that it was just chock full of classics that people wanted to hear and, and really get off on and enjoy it, you know. And it was midday, the sun was up, people were feeling good, and we just ramped it up a little bit. So I felt like pushing one song into the middle you know, it's always a risk because, you know, uh, how are people going to react to it and they don't know it and stuff. But the reaction was as if, like, we've been playing that song forever, you know, and, and that was quite remarkable. So it, it, we do take that as a as a good point um, that we're on the right track with the new album and that people are going to respond to it and hopefully really like it as much as we do, you know. Absolutely. Now, well, like you said, when you do play, play festivals like that and you uh, have to tone down your set a little bit, how do you guys uh, go about deciding what you want to give to the fans? Because you guys do have such a you know diverse and extensive catalog of music to choose from. How did you guys narrow that down and say, you know, we got the, all these old classics everybody knows, let's throw a little new stuff. How, how does that happen with you guys in the band as you talk about it? Well, yeah, I mean, it, it, it's kind of problematic. You know, I think... You know, there's a whole lot of bands. If you think of a, a, a lot of bands, you know, and, and this isn't anything against any of them, but let's say, you know, if I said to you, Europe, what's the first song that comes to your head? The Final, Final Countdown. Countdown. Absolutely. Exactly. Now, if I say, tell me the second song, what comes down to your head? It's Final Countdown. If I did the third one, it would be the Final Countdown. You'd be hard pushed to find the next one. And it's that and damn commercial's point. fault, too. <laughs> it is. It is. And there's a whole lot of bands that are like that, that have, you know, one or two songs that um, you may get, uh, and the rest of them might get a bit lost on you. But the, uh, not everybody, of course, but what, I'm, what I find with Venom is that, you know, when people ask for to hear particular songs, there's always songs that they don't hear, and it's like the list just gets endless. It goes on and on and on, and so when you're then confronted with doing a tour, You've got some elasticity. We've got songs we can pull in and pull out and put another one in and change it up a bit. But when you're doing a festival, you've got such a limited time. How do you how do you pick uh, uh, the songs from such a catalogue? I mean, on the one hand, it's brilliant because you have such an amazing legacy. You could put together any kind of set and people would get off on it. But there's classics you have to put in, like Countess Batteries and the Black Metals and Welcome to Hell and, and things like this, you know, which people just can't get enough of hearing. So, you know, we always put those standards in, witching hours and things as encores and stuff. And then we just play around with the rest. Like, we, you know, we opened up with something from uh, what we're seeing. And, you know, uh, the idea is to try and look for those songs to the, obviously the classics people want to hear and then try and look for something that, that is also classic but they may not have heard for a long, long time or in fact ever. Uh, they may never have heard it live played and that's the beauty of what we do is like we're not limited in any way. We can pick any song and, and, and put it in and just do it and uh, and so that, that, that's brilliant. I mean, the, the, the problem might be on the American tour, the North American tour, is the fact that we'll have the new album out. We've got to try and get that fitted in somewhere. So, Right. Uh, but for every for every 20 songs you play, there's 20 songs people will say, why didn't you play this, you know? So um, uh, on the one hand, it's, uh, it's uh, uh, impossible to play everything in one go, but it means that you could to have, you know, 10, 20 times and still have different songs coming in, which is also a great pleasure, you know? It's a, it's a great problem to have. It's always a great problem to have when you just, yeah. you, you can't give everybody what they want at once, so that means you get to come back and do it all over again. So that that's a phenomenal absolutely. problem to have. You know, absolutely. I mean, we, we, you know, some, some pretty good friends of ours, Diamond Head, you know. Oh, they yeah. Had, uh, uh, but they, you know, Metallica did the cover of Am I Evil, mm -hmm. and that's like their encore song, you know. Yep. So um, people tend to wait the whole show for them to play that at the end, you know. Mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, so they, they're obviously playing their music, people are getting into it, but they want to hear that song. If they didn't play that song, it'd be like, ah, for fuck's sake, you know. But we get to the pleasure of being doing that from the beginning to the end. And every time we play a song, it's another song that people consider a classic and want to hear. So it is a good it is a good problem to have. It it's yeah. very enjoyable. Absolutely, I actually got the pleasure of speaking with uh, Brian last Thursday before they were hitting Rocklahoma. So 
Oh, did you? Oh, I brilliant, did. Brilliant. I did. It, oh, was, great. it was great. But the bad thing is, is I think they're one of the bands that got bumped due to weather Saturday night because we had a horrific storm uh, pull through. And I, I think, heard, yeah. Yeah, I think they're one of the poor bands that got bumped. So that was kind of because oh, I was shit. with you. I, I'm, a, I'm a huge Metallica fan. I like have a shrine to them in my basement. So, really? Uh, brilliant. So I learned a lot of Diamond Head through Garage Inc. and all their covers through Metallica. Yeah. So that was real. I was so looking forward to that, man. And unfortunately, they got cut, and that was just such a bummer deal for me, honestly. Oh, shit. Yeah, yeah that is a bit of a bummer. That is a bit of a bummer. Yeah. And it's always nice to... It's kind of like finding the roots of where everything started, you know, and, and yeah. going all... It's all connected, you know, and I think that's that's be also uh, that's a bit of a shame. That's a bit of a shame. It know? is, and the, like you said, at the roots, man, of you know, you guys. I mean, you guys have been around for God, what, thirty eight years now? Thirty going on forty? <laughs> I mean, I know. Yeah, I said to someone the other day. I said, "Well, you know, you, if you think about it, thirty years ago, and they went forty, I went, what? They went forty years? It's forty years ago, not thirty. And I went, holy shit, is it? And they went, yeah, it's close enough. I was like, oh my god. Yeah, you. So, but. I was just going to say, I was just going to say, we've planned the next 40 years anyway, so we should be okay. There you go, yeah. But like you say, you know, you're talking about the roots. I mean, you guys are part of the roots, especially the uh, the black metal, the uh, the death metal, the just the straight-up hardcore stuff. I mean, you guys are, you know, pioneers of that. There would probably wouldn't be a lot of the bands out there if it wasn't for you guys. And, you know, there's people covering your stuff, kind of like Metallica covering, you know, Diamond Head, that people, you know, that's how they got to know you guys and became fans of you. So, I mean, it's great. It's it's, it's awesome the way it just plays out. Yeah, that's it. I think that's it. It's, it's inspirational. You know, Abaddon always said, you know, it's like having a child. You know, you 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 you, you have a child and then you, you teach it and you hope it's going to take from you and, and learn and expand and go one step further where, you know, where your limit was. They go beyond that. And and he's right, I think, you know, the description of, of the black metal genre and, and death metal and all, all, everything that followed after Um is exactly that. They took the, up the reins and they made it their own, you know, and, uh, but they took that inspiration, you know, and, and, and what was beautiful about, uh, uh, Venom, what they did, you know, uh, it, you know, you can classify it sonically and, and think, oh, bands took this and went this way and took that bit and went that way. But I think ultimately what happened was they, they smashed the corporate idea of controlling music, you know, they, they they just kicked a hole through the wall and everybody f- ran through it, you know. Um, they just they broke the mold. Uh, you can't do it that way was probably the most thing they ever heard. You can't do that. You can't do this. So they did. And um, <clears throat> it created create possibilities for everybody to come after and do what they wanted to do their way. Uh, and not only from bands, but also labels, you know. Uh, metal players, mega forces, uh, music for nations, all of these nuclear blasts, you know, all these labels came out of that as well. Right. You know, when you look back now, you, um, you, people tend to forget that, that the whole thing happened, you know, that everything um, from from those those few points, uh, it's quite incredible. It's quite incredible. Yeah, and and it honestly feels like with me doing what I do, um, the 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 black metal, the death metal, all that stuff that those all the different the genres that, that they want to break all those into, they're really almost at the forefront of the music industry compared to your just standard everyday just regular type rock it seems like you said like with the nuclear blast and napalms all those labels they're pushing you know your guys' music your type of music way more than anybody else's and it seems like it's it's growing larger than just your typical regular rock and that's because everybody's hearing about it everybody's getting out there and like you said it is more of like the you know, the anarchy of things of, hey, you're telling me to do this, well, I'm going to do this, and you guys just supply the soundtrack for it. Yes, exactly. I think that you, you, you just summed that up absolutely perfectly. Yeah. That, it, that is it, you know. And it's, it, uh, you know, when, when people were saying, oh, metal's dying and it's this and it's that, you know, we were going all over the planet. And on the ground, that, that couldn't be further from the truth. Uh, and um, And I think the new generation that's come through now, you know, when we we played the whiskey on the last tour uh, in L.A., 
and um, you know, I'd say 80% of the 80% of the people in the audience were between I don't know 17 and 22 or something. You know, and it's like wow. Wow, if we we could have done that two or three years earlier, and probably you know the majority percentage would have been over thirty. You know, right? Uh, and that's the difference. It's like the the kids now are basically they want to get those records, they want to listen to those old bands that were influential, they want to come and see live shows, they want to invest in new in in in, in the new uh, uh, product that's out there, and the new bands are out there in the live circuit, and to get a chance to see. You know, the bands that were doing it in the scene back in the day, you know, it's almost like it's theirs now. They own it and they want it. And so even though the, you know, the market, the general market, the corporations tried to streamline everything and control everything. And they did for they did for a period of time, right. um, and I think it, I think they've just lost a grip now, and the kids have got a bit bored with it. Like like every revolution, you know, uh, every every youth culture has a re- has their own revolution, and I think that's what's happening right now. And I think that's why you see all those bands and all those labels, like you said, Napalm Blast, everybody uh, pushing straight through and and promoting, and that all of their bands going out and all of their shows happening. Uh, it just seems so vibrant, but it's being driven by the fans who are coming to it and, and want to be part of something. Uh, and, you know, watching the show on your phone, for like we just said about Black is the Black, if you were there and you shoot the whole thing on your phone, you know, you disassociate from the live event, right. you know. Uh, and it's the same thing with, uh, you know, streaming music constantly. You know, if you don't have the vinyl, you don't have the product. You're kind of missing something, and I think the kids have realized that and went, hang on, you know, my old man had such a great record collection, I want one of them too. Right. And, uh, you know, my daughter's, my daughter's 15, and she, she, um, she said the other day to me, she went, um, we were in a store in London, uh, uh, like a grocery store, and they, they just set up a new stand for vinyl records. And she went, what are those? I went, oh, that's vinyl records. And she went, oh, wow, can I get some? <laughs> I was like, wow, amazing, yeah, if you've got something to play it on. Right. Um, you know, she yeah. she even went, her and her mum went out and bought me um, a, a new uh, stereo for, for my birthday and didn't buy any speakers or a power amp. And then asked me two months later, they said, are you not going to listen to your records? I said, yeah, well, I need speakers and a power amp. And my daughter was like, what's that then? <laughs> she thought she thought just the, just the actual turntable was enough to play your record. Right, like. right. But because, because now she's like Instagram and Snapchat and all that kind of online music and stuff, she's now getting into the actual vinyl thing and, and is finding it amazing. So, uh, yeah, it's it's incredible. It's coming back around again and, oh. and all healed to it. Absolutely. That's like uh, we saw, I saw Anthrax a few weeks ago and at the, at the venue, I could have bought their CD or their vinyl. I went for the vinyl. I don't know. I just, you know, just went for that vinyl, you know, it's, and, and that's it. You know, it's, we, we said that before, you know, um, it's like, uh, um, Abaddon said once before and, and, and it was like, yeah, that's right. It's like, you know, how many times have you picked up a CD case and it hasn't got a CD in it, or you got the wrong CD in it. But you never pick up an album sleeve of a vinyl and have the wrong record in there, right? Right. Be- because there's a there's a there's more attention to the detail when you play it. It's more interactive. It's the smell of the vinyl, the feel, the sleeve. The, the, you know, looking at the there's just something so great about it. It's a it's a real participation sport. And I think that's why I'm like you. You know, if, if I've got a choice of a CD or a vinyl, I have to go for the vinyl. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, Tony, uh, I know, luckily, I'm going to get to see you guys. You're coming through Kansas City. It looks on the uh, 10th of September, so I know I'm looking absolutely. forward to that. Um, definitely, hopefully, be able to just maybe shake your hand and say thank you for the interview in person. But uh, is there anything you want to say to the fans before we let you get on? I'm sure you got a lot of other people to talk to today. We have. It's pretty tight, Shadow. But I just want to say thank you very much. And, of course, you'll be our guest at the show, and I can't wait to get there. So you will get to meet the other boys and myself, and we will shake hands for sure. And I just want to say to the fans that, you know, we're, we're, we're proud to announce the American tour. Um, we put as many dates in as we can. Um, if, if it isn't enough or we miss somewhere out, we'll come back as fast as we can and finish off the rest of them. But um, we hope you like the new record. 
when it drops and um, we'll see you all out there please come to the show come and have a good time keep an open mind and just keep your head down and be safe all right bud we'll see you soon and i greatly appreciate your time sir thank you so much and you have a really good day and thank you so much for the time yes sir thank you tony bye-bye all the best bye for now